but they have higher hopes for themselves than maybe we have for them. Great to see you. This is going to be fun because we are going to start with the Chicago White Sox. Hold on. What? What were you just looking at there, Ken? Todd Let, always does this. No, if you if were, you're doing you were, something, he wants you to break you something. You were high tech on your phone right there. Something just You just got texted something. Todd, I'm going to tell you the truth. It's not that at all. You're going to love what this is. I was yeah, buying man. a New Jersey Transit bus ticket because I'm going right to the stadium from here. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you, don't, don't miss that. Hey, you better get on that right now. <laughs> I'm on it, man. It, it, it's the trade of the century. Money for a bus ticket. <laughs> All right, so, Ken, let's start with the White Sox on a non-A.J. Pruszynski day, but we get to start with Chicago because you just wrote about them. Let's begin with Pedro Grifol's manager tenure and what you wrote about. So what do you think? Well, what I wrote about was what he said last week when he said the team was, I'm not going to say the exact words, even though I know you guys would love me to, he said they were bleeping flat. And whenever a manager questions a team's effort, a player's effort, publicly, that can cause a problem and generally it does cause a problem it cost you some of the clubhouse and in Grafal's case the team is now 15 and 46 they've lost 12 straight they haven't won since this happened he probably is headed for an unfortunate reality that all managers eventually must face and that's the loss of his job so that was kind of the gist of what i wrote about just where those comments fit in the context of the season is this his fault no, it's not his fault. Not entirely, that's for sure. And in fact, I said in the column, he might not even be the fifth or sixth biggest reason why they are where they are. But at the same time, there's a new general manager there, first year for Chris Getz. And ultimately, Chris Getz might want his own guy. And you might ask, well, when's this going to happen? Why doesn't it happen right now? It seems that they are waiting till later in the season when they are ready to bring up some of their younger players. And then at that point, Maybe they'll want a new environment. Now, you could say, well, if they keep losing now, why not do it now? They might, for all I know. But keep in mind, owner Jerry Reinsdorf has a powerful voice with this team, obviously. He's the owner, and he is an involved owner. So it's hard to predict when this might happen, but it certainly isn't looking good for the team, for Pedro Grafal, for anybody involved with that organization. So about this team... Talk to me about maybe a little trade talk with Gar Garrett Crochet. I mean, one of the better pitchers in the league right now. Have you been hearing anything about that? Yes, and I wrote a story yesterday with Dennis Lynn of The Athletic about the Padres' specific interest in Crochet. They've been the most aggressive on him so far. It's early. We're still almost two months away from the deadline. And when you say the Padres have been the most aggressive, you might say, ooh, that's interesting. And it is, but A.J. Preller, their general manager, is always the most aggressive on players that he wants. What's interesting about Crochet, and we didn't get to this in the story, probably should have, is that he is going to face an innings, not limit at some point, but this is his first full year as a starter. How long is he going to go as a starter this season? Now, maybe if you're the Padres or some other team, you look at him as a guy that you can get, start him when you need to, relieve him if you need to, but the White Sox are going to value him as a number one starter. So it's going to be interesting to see what they do with him. They have a number of pieces that they can move. Luis Robert Jr., of course, back healthy, home run last night. Eric Fetty, he's a starting pitcher who has done well. I don't know that he would start a playoff game, but he can certainly help get you there. Tommy Pham, others as well. Michael Kopech. But they're going to have some difficult decisions ahead here and who they want to keep, who they want to let go, who they want to build around with and – Grochet is a very interesting part of that equation one way or the other. FT is headed to the MLB All-Star Game this year, and there's only one way you should be finding tickets for any ball game. SeatGeek is the official ticket marketplace of Major League Baseball, so they have you covered for all of your baseball ticket needs. I'm super pumped to hit the Futures game this year. That new skills competition looks electric. I agree, Kratz. It's like the Olympics for baseball. Cannot wait to see that. With over 28 million downloads, SeatGeek is the number one rated ticketing app. Baseball season's in full swing, and you don't want to miss out. SeatGeek has your tickets to every game and, of course, concerts, festivals, and more. Every ticket's backed by their buyer guarantee, and SeatGeek is the only site that lets you return your tickets ahead of the event with swaps. 
And Kratz, you know FT came through for the people. Use our code FOUL for $20 off tickets at SeatGeek. That's 20 bucks off your first purchase with promo code F-O-U-L. Make sure you click the link in the description to download the app, please. Crochets on, could be on the move. That's exciting for teams. I went on a Baltimore station, your, your old hometown, and they wanted Crochet. And I was like, I don't know. Same thing as what you said. But the Astros, the Astros seem to make moves. And if Dana Brown says... They're in. Does Ken Rosenthal buy that? Yes, because the owner, Jim Crane, is someone who is not inclined to sell. I want to get back to Crochet for one second, and then I'll get to your question, Eric. The Orioles, you mentioned them. They are actually a better fit for Crochet with the White Sox than probably the Padres are. And the reason for that is the Orioles are so deep in young position players. And if you remember, in the Dylan Cease trade, the White Sox got some pitching back they know that at some point they're going to need position players. So the Orioles, from that perspective, might be an easier team to match up with. Now, the Astros. Dana Brown, their GM, has said, he told the Athletics Chandler Rome, that I cannot see any scenario in which we will be sellers. You can look at the standings and wonder why he is saying such a thing, but as I said, the owner of the team, Jim Crane, his idea is to compete every year. And they still believe, and not without justification, that they have a ton of talent on that team, that they can mount a push here and at some point get in the mix. Now, with Jose Urquidy and Christian Javier both needing to undergo elbow surgery, as the team announced today, that complicates the equation. McCullers is going to come back eventually, but they're really running the risk here of thinning out their rotation to the point where it's truly problematic. So let's see what the next two months bring. Teams are not stupid. Owners are not stupid. If the reality is that it's not happening for them this year, then maybe they do sell. We've seen surprising things happen close to the deadline. I remember one year the Tigers were not going to sell, not going to sell, not going to sell, and then they did. And even the Mets last year, they had no intention of selling at this point in the season, and they ended up doing just that. So the Astros certainly are not wired this way. Jim Crane is not wired this way, but on June 5th, I'm not going to sit here and proclaim anything is set in stone. One thing about the deadline, I say this every year, executives, people with teams can say what they want publicly and have their quotes be whatever they want to be. But at the same time, we don't have to believe them entirely. And that's kind of the case here. Very good, very good. Um, Let's go to the Yankees for a little bit. Uh, They've been doing unbelievable lately. Their strong performance has (laughs) surpassed a lot of people a lot of people's expectation considering Garrett Cole, you know, went on the shelf. Um, what can we expect from him moving forward? How's he been doing? And uh, what's going to happen with this rotation, big dog? This is going to be something very interesting to talk about in the next couple weeks here. Well, Cole had his first rehab start last night, did well. Doesn't seem to be any problems with him. He's on track to come back. Whether he makes one more rehab start or two or three, that remains to be seen. I imagine it will be a return that happens sooner rather than later. You don't want to waste his bullets in the minor leagues if he's healthy. But at the same time, you don't want to go too quickly. And at a time when the team is, as you said, Todd, rolling, you don't need to rush this. You can take your time and have it work out however it's going to work out, naturally. As for their rotation, they just lost Clark Schmidt. Right latch strain, it's probably a couple of months. And the whole question of, whoa, what happens to Luis Hill when Cole comes back? Of course, it just got answered by the Schmidt injury. They're in pretty good shape, but with all teams that have rotation strength, they're one or two injuries away from a problem. They do have some younger guys, some depth. We've seen Petit. There are others as well that they can turn to, even after trading so much pitching in the Juan Soto deal. But Cole coming back healthy would be so big for them because then you think of a rotation that has Cole at the top, It still has heel, of course. Cortez and Rodon have been really good, and you're looking at something that's pretty special. Who knows how long Luis Heel can keep this up, and not so much in terms of quality, but in terms of sustaining the innings, given that he didn't pitch much the past two years coming off Tommy John surgery. But, hey, these are rich people's problems right now for the Yankees. They've got a great (laughs) thing going, and with Cole coming back, they get even richer. Ken, I'll mix in some fan questions. For this one, I'll add to it. So Toasty, who's one of our 
smarter members Ooh. of the FT fam said, assuming the Padres are trying to add and crochet doesn't work out. Is Jesus Lazardo a possibility or anyone else that you can think of? I just want to add one comment here. And I know you kind of touched on it. Garrett crochet is barely pitched in the bigs since he came in into the league. If you're looking at starters, he hasn't even gotten close to a hundred innings. So just based on the law of averages, it usually does not work out well either later in the season for someone like that or in the future if you overwork them in a season like this. He's not suddenly going to pitch, you know, 150 innings plus the playoffs. I mean, he could, but chances are it would not end well. Do you agree? I do agree. And certainly that's a consideration for any team that wants to acquire him. But I would think if you're the Padres, let's just use them as an example. And you want Garrett Crochet, you're not just getting him for this year. You're getting him, I believe, for two more. So you're thinking, okay, we'll get what we can this year, do what we can to maximize his innings. And then we have him building up next year to a greater extent, and then the year after that as well. So it's not a one-year situation, though certainly when you're contending, you want to use him as much as you can. As for Luzardo, yeah, he's going to be available. He did not pitch well last night, but he's someone who is really good. The Marlins are going to trade him. There's not much question about that. He might end up being one of the best starting pitchers traded uh, at the deadline. No question. Eric Kratz here from FT. I'm a former athlete that really pays attention to his routine. And AG1 every morning before my workouts is something that gets my day going. Hey, Braun here. AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that delivers daily nutrients and gut health support, and it's backed by multiple research studies so you can trust what you're putting in your body. Unlike other products, which only test their ingredients in isolation, AG1 tests their formula as a whole. Ready for this stat? 97% of people in a research study felt more energy after 30 days of drinking AG1. If I had to recommend one product to support whole body health, it's AG1, and that's why FT is excited to have them as a new partner. Starting your journey with AG1 is a win. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase at drinkag1.com slash foul. That's drinkag1.com slash F-O-U-L. Go check it out, FT fam. Um, I, I have a question based off a uh, conversation we had at the top of the show and how much parity we have. There's only four teams in the National League right now that are above the 500 mark. And basically all but like four or five teams are in playoff contention right now. Uh, Kelsey asked for Ken, how can MLB keep expanded playoffs but challenge mid teams to be more competitive? Time to switch up the divisions? Well, the switch up of divisions will eventually happen once there is realignment and once there is expansion. I should have proceeded saying realignment with expansion. Expansion by two teams will lead to 32 teams in the league. And at that point, the league will realign. Not going to happen until then. And this whole question of the expanded playoffs, whether they're good for the game, bad for the game, neither here nor there, that's something that's still we need to see more of because I'm not kind of convinced either way right now. I don't like the fact that teams that are 500 suddenly can have a little run like the Diamondbacks did last year and then go all the way through. It, it seems kind of weird in baseball when you have 162 games to play that that can happen. But the way the system works right now, that can happen. And it's certainly something that other teams are pointing to. All these teams on the fringes right now are saying, hmm, Maybe we can be this year's Diamondbacks. Now, the other side of that is maybe it's good that you have things occur like they did last season with the Diamondbacks. Maybe that gives more teams hope and maybe it makes things more interesting. To me, this sport, though, is predicated on the length of its season, 162, and that has been without question devalued. You now have much more of a March Madness feel to October, and that's exciting. It's fun. It leads to upsets, but it doesn't really honor what this sport has honored throughout its history, which is the regular season. All right. One last trade question for me because I had to ask our resident Yankee lover, hopeful Yankee fan, what do the Yankee fans need? And his answer was possibly a Ryan McCann, which McMahon, McMahon I'm sorry, McCann, McMahon. I was thinking of James McCann, but Ryan McMahon 
who is an elite what the only elite player really from the Rockies would the Rockies allow that ownership wise to get rid of one of their pieces that they feel like they extended and is part of their team to move forward to whatever it is that the Rockies ownership wants to do I doubt it based on their history and I know Yankee fans have been talking about Ryan McMahon as if he can be their possession anytime now but <laughs> The Rockies routinely see themselves as better than they are. I don't know if that's the right phrasing exactly, but they have higher hopes for themselves than maybe we have for them. And McMahon is a part of that. He's a part of that equation for them. They're not a team that has ever gone fully into rebuild mode. They've traded some superstars, yes, but they've still tried to compete. They don't have much to trade. That's true. It's Elias Diaz. It's... Jalen Beeks, that's about it as far as potential free agents are concerned. McMahon would bring them a lot. But at the same time, if DJ LeMayhew comes back strong and Rizzo gets going, the need for McMahon becomes, I would think, less. And the Yankees will probably prefer to focus on their bullpen and perhaps their rotation if it becomes a situation where there is a need there. There currently is not a need there. So that's how I see it. Things change. Maybe the Rockies' perspective changes, but based on their history, it doesn't seem to me that they're going to trade a McMahon. You might say, well, they traded Arenado, but Arenado was miserable. He was unhappy there, and that's what kind of fueled that. Same thing with Tulowitzki years before that. Yeah, and I think that ownership has a close relationship with Ryan McMahon, and for a team that runs itself mom-and-pop style, yeah. They like a dude. Mm. It's their toy. They're probably not trading him. He's a good guy. He's pretty solid. You know, people know who he is, kind of, in, in Colorado. So, yeah, that makes sense to me. Uh, Ken, thank you very much. Appreciate you. Uh, have fun on the bus. All right. Thanks, guys. <laughs> thank you. Ken talked about the Rockies, too, is one of the fan questions in Fair Territory. So check that out as well, wherever you get your podcasts. And on this FT YouTube channel. Yesterday's episode came out. Usually it's Mondays. We did a little Tuesday episode with Ken. So that is up there for the world to consume. Of course, he covered the Marcano uh, lifetime ban from Major League Baseball and the four suspended players for the whole betting bonanza that went on and um, that scandal, but a lot more that he covered in there as well in fair territory. Hey everybody, be sure to like and subscribe for more content. We're back here every weekday, all year long, so do not miss an episode. The videos are coming in all day. Here's another video you might enjoy. Baseball, the way it should be covered.